You're listening to Reach MD XM157, the channel for medical professionals. Hi, this is Dr. Thomas Berceau, president of the National Lipid Association, and I'd like to welcome you to Lipid Luminations, hosted by Dr. Larry Kaskill and presented by the National Lipid Association. My guest today is Dr. Terry Jacobson, Professor of Medicine, Director in the Office of Health Promotion and Disease Prevention at Emory University School of Medicine, and we're going to discuss non-HDL testing. Dr. Jacobson, welcome to Lipid Luminations. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, Larry. For all those listening who've never heard of this, they've heard of HDL, they've heard of LDL, but what exactly is non-HDL testing? Non-HDL is a test a measure of all your atherogenic lipoproteins. While LDL is one of the best measures of risk assessment, it turns out it underestimates risk in certain patients. And on every laboratory slip that folks get, one can get or calculate a non-HDL. It's simply subtracting HDL from total cholesterol, and it measures not only LDL, but all the other atherogenic particles. Such as? Such as it measures what we call the LDL, which is a measure of triglycerides, measures what we call intermediate dense lipoprotein, and also measures lipoprotein A. Now, in a typical laboratory slip, one doesn't get these individual measurements, but simply subtracting the good cholesterol, HDL, from the total you're really capturing all the bad atherogenic proteins. I call it the poor man's glycosylated hemoglobin of lipids. It captures all the risk in all the different particles that are atherogenic in the bloodstream. And it's not that LDL is a bad measure of risk. It's still our main target. But our secondary target of treatment particularly in patients with elevated triglycerides above 200, is the non-HDL. So here's something very simple on every laboratory slip that one can calculate themselves. Hopefully, labs in the future will calculate this for physicians and health providers, but it's been a battle to get them to do that, frankly. So whatever battles are going on in our government seem to be also going on between the major labs, and we cannot come to any bipartisan agreement on getting this as a national guideline. Yeah. I mean, there's no, with lipids, there's no such thing as a bipartisan agreement. The goal is to reduce cardiovascular risk in our patients. I think all of us agree with that. And the thing is, we've done a tremendously great job getting LDL down and LDL to goal. But what we've appreciate over the years is many patients still have events even at goal. And we call this residual risk risk beyond their LDL measurement. And this is captured in the non-HDL cholesterol, and that's why the National Lipid Association believes it's a very important target of therapy that is being overlooked on every lipid panel received in the United States today. So really, to reduce cardiovascular disease in this country, we want to optimize all lipids as well as lifestyle and other therapies, non-HDL is the secondary goal of therapy after LDL, particularly in patients with triglycerides above 200. Let's take an example case. Let's say we have a 46-year-old gentleman with a total cholesterol of 260 and an HDL of 40. By your calculations, simply all we do is take the 260, subtract 40, and we have a non-HDL of 220. Is that correct? That is correct. See, very simple. Took you all five seconds to calculate that. And that 220 obviously sounds high. For some reason, we need to have the non-HDL 30 points higher than the LDL. Can you explain where that comes from? Sure. Essentially, we all know the LDL goals. For CHD, it's LDL less than 70. We now advocate even for diabetics less than 70. For patients with primary prevention and two risk factors, their LDL goal is 100. We set the non-HDL goal 30 points higher than their LDL goal. So if your LDL goal is 70, your non-HDL goal is 100. 
if your LDL goal is 100, your non-HDL goal is 30. The way it is set, and the reason 30 was chosen, is that generally the measurement of triglycerides, if you divide that by 5, that equals what we call the LDL, very low-density lipoprotein. And since a normal triglyceride is considered less than 150, dividing 150 by 5 gives you 30. So on top of your LDL, adding these 30 points, that's what we consider normal. And that's where the derivation of the 30 milligrams came from. It was the understanding that we want triglycerides below 150. If you have elevated triglycerides and other particles in your bloodstream that are atherogenic, your non-HDL will be high. And and the beauty of non-HDL is that we can intervene on it like we can intervene on LDL. We have great treatments, both non-pharmacologic and pharmacologic, to get non-HDL to goal. Let's talk a little bit about what some of those interventions may be. Uh, Assuming we have a patient that is at goal with their LDL, and they're on a maximum dose of the statin or whatever dose of statin it took to get their LDL down to 70, and now we're going after the non-HDL. What is the first line of attack? Do you use lifestyle change? Do you use exercise? Do you use carbohydrate avoidance? Do you use different oils? What, what do you like to use? Their lifestyle change is still the first thing we do in all patients. Often we do it simultaneously with drug therapy if you're at high risk. If you have CHD and diabetes, I will start lifestyle, diet and exercise, weight loss, smoking cessation as I begin statin therapy. Once I can intensify lifestyle, but most likely that is not going to get the non-HDL to goal if it hasn't gone the LDL to goal. What are some of the ways to get non-HDL to goal? There's essentially two ways. That's either to lower triglycerides in patients with trigs above 200 or to drive LDL down even further. So what are the drugs? Let me just tell you the drugs that drive triglycerides down. Three major drugs. They are the fibrates, phenofibrate or gemfibrozole. There is niacin often in the form of niospan or over-the-counter niacin. Um, And then there's omega-3 fatty acids, also known as fish oils. The prescription product is called Leveza. These drugs lower triglycerides by about, uh, depending on your baseline triglycerides, anywhere between 30 and 40%, but they drive triglycerides down and non-HDL goes down as well. And so those are great choices if patients have elevated triglycerides, but their LDL is already at goal. Now, for some patients, still have an elevated LDL, but also have an elevated non-HDL, but they might have normal triglycerides. For them, beyond a statin, they'll either require LDL-lowering drugs, and those include drugs like azetamide, zetia, the bile acid sequestrants, cholestyramine, cholecelevam, these are pure LDL-lowering drugs. So we have really good options to lower non-HDL, both non-pharmacologically and pharmacologically, but it all depends if your triglycerides are elevated or not, which choice you're going to take. And so generally statins are great LDL-lowering drugs. They do lower triglycerides and non-HDL as well. And so this is adding, on top of a statin, other agents that are very successful in reducing non-HDL. If you've just tuned in, you're listening to Lipid Luminations on ReachMD XM 157. I'm your host, Dr. Larry Kaskill. My guest today is Dr. Terry Jacobson. And Dr. Jacobson is a professor of medicine at Emory University School of Medicine. And we're discussing non-HDL testing, which is an emerging target for residual risk Dr. Jacobson, what are some of the weaknesses, if any, of non-HDL testing? I know that when when you get an LDL below 100, the, the Friedwald calculation kind of loses some of its power. So does some of that also happen to the non-HDL part of the equation? Actually not, Larry. The beauty of non-HDL is that it's capturing 
atherogenic lipoproteins beyond LDL. And so, yes, an LDL can be misleading because there's different types of LDL. There's a dense LDL. There's a fluffy LDL. We think the dense LDL, which is smaller, is more atherogenic, more likely to cross the vessel wall, get oxidized, cause plaque formation. And what we found over the years, particularly looking at diabetics and patients with insulin resistance, that they have an abundance of LDL particles that are small, but when you measure the LDL concentration in the blood, a diabetic's LDL seems low. The mean LDL of diabetics is 120, but in general, most of that LDL is, is what we call atherogenic pattern B. It's small, dense LDL. And so a diabetic, although their LDL looks normal, it really is not. And that's why we now consider diabetics a CHD risk equivalent because they have more LDL particles, even though when you measure LDL in their blood, it seems like it's normal, but you have more LDL particles and thus more of a nidus of atherosclerosis. These particles are very atherogenic. You asked, what are the limitations of non-HDL? There's very few limitations. The advantages are tremendous. You do not need a fasting specimen like you do with a lipid panel, particularly if you have elevated triglycerides. It's automatically calculated easily by subtracting HDL from total cholesterol. It's standardized because the measure of total cholesterol and HDL is really excellent. And so generally, it's a really excellent marker of atherogenic proteins, and there's enough data out there that it's a, probably a better predictor of cardiovascular risk than LDL. Now, I don't want to attack LDL because that is the guidelines, and that is the first way of treatment and therapy, but this is moving now beyond LDL to start to target those other lipoproteins most of them are unmeasured, but they're captured in the non-HDL measurement. If you get the non-HDL to goal and the LDL to goal, you've probably eliminated 95% of that patient's risk from lipids, both measured and unmeasured lipids. Well, on that note, Dr. Terry Jacobson of Emory University School of Medicine, thank you very much for joining me on Lipid Luminations. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to Lipid Luminations, presented by the National Lipid Association. For more information, visit www.lipid.org.